Hello, and welcome to the heart of Fiat Crucified Love. This week, we are going to talk about the virtue of listening to God and what it means to be a sheep. We can learn a lot from studying as sheep, right? Why did he use that analogy in, in scripture so much? He said, my sheep hear my voice. But what kind of pulls this all together is um, the title, Why Saints Need Saints, right? It's all connected. Saints need saints so that we can hear the voice of God. And God speaks to each saint in a different way, but um, it's, we're supposed to help each other and complement each other, right? So we'll just start with a prayer in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Sweet Jesus, I praise and adore and I love you. I thank you. I ask you to be with us, be with my listeners today. Be with the souls you desire to hear this and encounter this, this week, this month, this year, and 50 years to come. I ask you to pour your Holy Spirit abundantly upon me as I speak and upon them as they listen. I ask you to open our hearts so they won't be hard, they won't be cold, they won't be closed, they won't be competitive or jealous, but instead that we may be in imitation of the saints who um, very willingly embraced friendships with other saints. They helped each other. And we ask this in your holy name. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and we will be recreated, and thou will renew the face of the earth. I'm not going to do it anymore. I, I tried to play before. I just, I don't really have time to play music these days, and I just don't have it in my heart. You know, there's times of my life where the Holy Spirit, sometimes people say, why are you so busy? And it's because when I have the grace to do something, I better do it. Otherwise, I don't have the grace later on. So there's times where I have lots of musical grace, and then there's times I just don't. There's times I have artistic grace to paint and do things, and then I don't, or to write, right? So um, today is a day where um, I'm more tired, but I, I have this that I want to share with you from my heart. So I'm going to hope that the Holy Spirit speaks to you through it. And I chose that song because um, holy is the lamb, and we're called to be a lamb like Christ. We're called, you know, to be his sheep. And it's, it's really important. Um, you know, 
Jesus said in scripture that his sheep hear his voice. And, you know, I meditate often on what it means to be a sheep. And um, I never thought about it before, but a friend recently was saying about, um, about different breeds of sheep. And so I wanted to look up and study this because um, people joke all the time about they've never met somebody with so many spiritual children as me and so different, right? If you look at my life, the Lord just kind of stretches me. You know, sometimes you're put like, um, you know, St. Damien of Malachi was put in Hawaii on that island and those were his sheep and he just concentrated and that was it forever, right? And then there's missionaries, you know, you look at some of the apostles or you think of um, Therese of Lisieux after she died, that who are, who are just spread all over the earth, right? And I'm a little bit more like that. So in one morning, in, in, in an hour and a half, I'll have to answer an email about Africa and then about the Middle East and then arrange something in Spanish in Central America. And then I'll have somebody from Granger, and then I'll have something to do in Poland, and then I'll have a package I'm supposed to get to Russia. Like it's, um, you know, sometimes they're wealthy, sometimes they're poor, sometimes they're educated, sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're well-known people, and sometimes they're, you know, the little nobodies. And, and the kinds of souls, the situations that are brought to me are so different. So I've kind of benefited by by kind of looking up, what does this mean? And it's interesting. I've got here two papers on different breeds of sheep, okay? And I think it's kind of cool to look at. If you look at the different pictures here, there's all sorts of different sheep. You know, when you think about a sheep, you think about one, like, ba ba black sheep, have you any wool? You know, there might be a black and a white, and that's it. But um, there are as many different, no, there's less, I guess I was going to say as many different sheep as there are saints, but there's not because there's 900 breeds I found out reading my books, right? I, I got these pictures and then I got some books to kind of study sheep. Know your sheep. Each page is a different sheep and a different description. And, um, you know, just look at those four. Those are four very different kinds of sheep, right? And I got a book written by a woman who is a Yorkshire shepherdess right? And it's a year in the life of her, of her shepherdessness, right? And so it just kind of takes you through her experience with sheep. And it's been very interesting because, um, you know, I sat here because it's why do saints need saints? And so I kind of have all my saints. I have a few scattered in the apartment, but I pulled them all back here so you can have a good look at them, right? They're all kind of behind me. And they're all so different. And why do we love, why do I love having them with me? Because they're my friends, because we need each other, right? And sheeps all, sheeps, <laughs> sheep all differ very much. Um, and each breed has a different personality. You know, one breed might be more outgoing and another is very skittish and shy. Some are very dependable, but they're, um, you know, uh, more laid back. Others, you know, are, are better, fun, you know, pets for your children. Some are awfully grumpy, but they're durable. Those are the ones that have been around for 10,000 years. Some have better wool. Some have better meat. <laughs> so, you know, some breed better. And so um, each one is a different gift. And it reminds me of that passage in St. Paul about us. You know, each person is given a different spiritual gift. One is given, you know, healing. Another is preaching. Another is administration. Another is, you know, um, the gift of prayer. Are all made prophets? No. You know, do all interpret dreams? No. You know, everybody is given different gifts. And you look at these saints behind me and it's the same thing. Each one is given different gifts. They're each given different spiritualities. When I took a picture of my sheep and I, I sent it to my publisher, just I was making a joke because I kept sending him things from different people all over the country or the world. <laughs> and I said, I have too many sheep, don't I? Um, and he said, well, that's why there's so many spiritualities in the world. And I'm like, you're right. You know, I'm, I'm seeing a podcast come together. <laughs> but I mean, that is why because we're all so different. And yet, what are we bonded together in? 
above all, all things put on love, right? We're united in love and we're united in the Holy Spirit that fills us with love. But when the Holy Spirit makes us perfect and makes us who God created us to be, we're not going to be like each other. We shouldn't even try to be like another saint. We want to be the, the, the person, the saint that God created us to be. When we were in our mother's womb and he was knitting us together, he chose not only your hair and your eyes and your size, he chose your talents, he chose your, your likes and your dislikes. He chose, you know, different aspects of um, your personality, your strengths, the weaknesses he was going to let you have. He chose your family for you and your country, your language, the education you'd have. But he also chose spiritual gifts. He, he, he saw before you what you were going to do and be and encounter in life. And he put there what you needed. And even among the saints, those vary greatly, greatly. You know, there are some saints that could never learn Latin and never learn another language. And then there are saints that wrote treatises for the church and other languages and multiple languages. Jerome translated the whole Bible, you know, um, and, and God makes us all different. He makes us different sheep from each other, but we need each other. Why do saints need saints? It's very interesting to me. And I think, you know, there's a multiple of reasons. Um, one is because, you know, in the garden, Jesus said, it is not good that man be alone. Let's make a partner for him. Let's make someone. He didn't create us to be sol solitary people. And if you study sheep, they're not solitary animals. They're very social. And I think... They're like that to protect themselves from predators, but they stay together in groups. They, you know, goats kind of wander off by themselves, but the sheep, they know each other. They need each other, right? You know, babies really love and want to be with their mothers. They have, they stay with, um, you know, the people, if you put a bunch of sheep from different breeds together, they'll kind of congregate in their own breed, you know, they, because they bond the same way like a family. Um, has natural, you know, bonds and drawing to people of your own family. Usually, not always, right? But there's a lot you can learn about what God, did. there's a reason he called us his sheep and he was the shepherd because um, we need each other as well because there's a lot of spiritual predators in this world. And the saints, we see how they helped each other in that way. I was... So I started to think about this podcast this morning. It's the feast of St. Damien of Malachi in Hawaii and St. John of Avila, who lived a long time before um, and was brilliant in spiritual direction. They lived in different opposite parts of the world and um, they spoke different languages. They had different missions. Um, but I saw an example of this podcast in both of their lives this morning. One was Damien and how he knew his mission. God sent him to work with the lepers and he was willing to pour his life out. And yet the entire time he was there, he wrote to his bishop, he wrote to his superiors begging for companions, for people to help him, not just because the work was so heavy on him, but also because human, you know, saints need saints. They need people, you know, even Saints need somebody to encourage them, to, to pray with them, to, you know, we're, we were created to be together. And so you look at him or you look at like Charles de Foucault, who was a hermit. And he, you know, went down into Algeria and he lived among the Muslims and he had a hermit vocation. And yet, till the day he got murdered, the day he died as a martyr, he begged the Lord for brothers. Even hermits need brothers. Saints need saints, right? And you see that with John of Avila. Um, I also have behind me here a bunch of relics. And one of the relics that I have um, is St. John of God. It's very interesting. I was going to pull it out here. And um, I don't have an image of John of God, but I have one of his relics. And um, 
St. John of God heard St. John of Avila preaching and he converted, right? So, you know, that saint, in order for John of God to become a saint, he needed St. John of Avila to preach. And he did. He, he heard him and he converted. And yet, then he got so on fire, he went home and he said, I got to throw out all of my secular books. I need to live only for God. My, he's my one pearl, you know. And he burnt all of his books and um, he really was set on fire. And so people falsely accused of him of insanity and threw him in a mental ward. The man was totally sane. He just loved God. But people who are worldly don't understand that. And they falsely accused him. And in those times, mental wards were e like, I was going to say, even more abusive than today. I mean, they're not kind places today all the time. Sometimes they are in some places, but some places they aren't. Um, but they used to physically whip them every day and stuff. And he was just, he was bloodied and bruised. And John of Avila, who converted him, heard about it and went. And he got him out and he said, get off of him. No, he's not insane. He's a saint. And he, he had to send him to another part of the hospital to heal from all the wounds he had from being beaten and things. But St. John of God needed St. John of Avila. He needed him to convert and he needed him to save him from the wicked people who did that to him, right? I think of Monica and Augustine. You know, St. Augustine, he needed lots of saints on his road. He needed his mother, Monica, to be a saint who prayed for many years. He needed St. Anselm to guide him once he decided to turn his life around. I think about even just Mary and Joseph. And, you know, Our Lady was the most perfect human being. Jesus was God. And yet God did not put him on an island. He knew that we need each other, right? And like, it's interesting because Jesus is our shepherd, but he's also called the lamb of God, the lamb. He is like a sheep too, and sheep need each other. So Mary and Joseph had to form a community. And then even when Joseph died and Jesus died, Jesus knew that it was not good that woman be alone. And he entrusted our lady to John. Right? Here's my John. Saints need saints. Saint, you know, you look at Saint Martin de Porres and Saint Rose of Lima in Peru. You've got two heroically saintly people. And yet, they had a deep friendship. They, when Saint Rose of Lima needed encouragement, she went and found Saint Martin de Porres. And they would talk. And they would help each other. Why? Because saints need saints. Padre Pio used to write his confessors all the time, saying, I would not make it through all of this pain if I didn't have you as a friend to help me. You know, and Padre Augustino was taken away from him. But he would still write letters and say, I will lose my mind. I am in hell if I don't have your help. Saints need saints. St. Saint Catherine of Siena. She had her saintly Raymond of Capua, I think is how you pronounce it, her spiritual director. St. Conchita in Mexico had Luis de Martinez. Benedict in Scholastica. Benedict, the, you know, the father of monasticism. He came to see his sister Scholastica in a group with other brothers because they all were on that path to sanctity together. And he went to see his sister. And his sister begged him to stay. Why, if she was so holy? Because they needed that encouragement. They needed the gifts that complemented each other. Why were so many religious communities founded as men and women? St. Vincent de Paul and Mary de Malarec or something. But they needed each other. Francis needed Claire. Francis was out preaching, forming this community. Claire was in a cloister. But he depended on her prayer and her discernment. And Claire needed Francis to guide in some ways. She needed those conversations when he would come to visit her. Because saints need saints. If you look at the letters that, you know, Francis Xavier wrote back home when he was off, you know, trying to convert, you know, India and China and everywhere over there, you know. 
And he was exhorting his people, come, come, we don't have enough people. Yes, it was because the work was too much, but it was also because he needed the other people present there. Oftentimes when a religious community is founded, the founder has the vision, but there's somebody else that God raises up that has the gifts of administration to kind of organize it. Look at St. Mother Teresa. She needed that priest to come and to, to write a rule and get it to Rome and like take care of all of that. Her gifts were very different than the priest that helped her but they both had to work together, right? St. Therese of Lisieux needed her community of sisters when she was dying. She needed them to take care of her. She needed the saint, one of the greatest saints of our times, needed letters to uncanonized men that they exchanged in friendship. She was spiritually mother to them, but they were her brothers, they were her friends. They helped her. I'll never forget that line that she said, that Jesus is my treasure, but I found him in you, right? But St. John Paul II, look at him, the great. And yet he would sneak out of the back door of the Vatican to visit his old Polish friends to go skiing. He would oftentimes gather around him other people and he would study, like the scientist he would have over for lunch and ask them about what was going on in the science world, you know? He was so interested because he knew he wasn't an expert in everything. They had gifts that he needed in order to make decisions to guide the church. And he brought in a whole convent of sisters to live there to pray. Why? Their gift of prayer was different than his apostolic gift in the world. But they needed each other. Saints need saints. And yet the common thread among all of this is that everybody was, was looking on God and seeking God, right? So they're united in that love, in that looking towards God and seeking him. But the way that it's manifested in their lives is very different, right? Right? And I think you see the same thing with all of these sheep. They all look very different, right? But they're all sheep. They act different. They have different gifts that we can use in this world. But they're still sheep. And when Jesus said, you know, you're, you're my sheep. I am your shepherd. You know, they're, they're all included. The same way he says that, you know, you're my children and I'm your shepherd. We're all included. Jesus is our shepherd. It's really interesting because sheep can't see well. They have peripheral vision. They can see 300 degrees around them. Their eyes are kind of on the sides of their heads. So, um, but if you come up directly behind them, they won't see you. And if you're right in front of them, they don't have any depth perception, right? But they can see kind of on the sides, but their sense of hearing is incredible. And it's because they have to always be listening and attuned for predators coming, right? But it's funny, if you talk to shepherds or shepherdesses, they'll say that like when they're coming towards a sheep that loves them, if the sheep sees them, they don't respond. But when they hear that voice, they might as well be jumping for joy the way they start bleeding and coming to bleating, right? Bah. And coming to... um their caretaker, their shepherd, or their shepherdess. That voice, you know, excites them and they know where to go. Jesus said in scripture, what? My sheep hear my voice. We're supposed to be listening for Jesus the same way that a sheep does. And when we hear him, sometimes on this side of eternity, things are blurry. Our vision isn't great. We do not have the beatific vision here at all, right? We just don't. There are certain things that we can see about God or know. You might, you might even have an experience where you physically see something heavenly. Some people, you know, die and, and have a vision of heaven and come back to life. I haven't, but I've heard it, right? But most of us don't even have that. We don't get visions like that. And yet, 
we're still called to follow Christ. So he's not calling us dependent upon our vision. What did he say to St. Thomas? Blessed are those who do not see and believe. You know, you saw and you believe, Thomas. Blessed are those who do not see and yet believe. Well, when you hear something, there's almost like an act of faith that you have to jump out because it sounds like that person, right? But you don't see it. You don't have proof yet. We're called to hear the voice of Christ and to follow. And he says, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a theme that's all throughout scripture where the Lord says here, right? In the Old Testament, hear, O Israel. The Lord your God is your God alone. You must love him with all of your mind and your heart and your soul and your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. Hear, O Israel. You know, in the new scripture, in the New Testament, Jesus often emphasizes something important by saying, amen, amen, I say to you. That's his way of saying, listen to me. And then, you know, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it doesn't bear fruit. That's him saying, listen. You know, it's like that when the room is loud and the teacher's trying to get everybody's attention, she might ring a bell or bang on the desk or something, you know, okay, guys, listen, that's Jesus saying, amen, amen, I say to you. And I love that passage of Psalm 45, which St. John of Avila wrote a whole book on called, listen, my daughter, and it's listen, my daughter. You know, turn your ear to me, forget your father's house, for the king desires your beauty. And the whole book explains all the different voices that can be in this world and how each one tries to draw us away from God. And are we going to listen to the world? Are we going to listen to people around us? Are we going to listen to Satan and temptations? Are we going to listen to our own desires, our own thoughts? Or are we going to be good little sheep, even if we're all different, and listen to the voice of the shepherd? If we're good little sheep and we listen to that voice of the shepherd, we'll be on the same path, even if we're different. Even if you live in Sokoto, Af in Nigeria, and you're persecuted by the Muslims, and I... I'm a Polish American that lives in Indiana without being persecuted by the Muslims, <laughs> right? You might be a peddler in, in Puerto Rico. And another person is, you know, a, a bishop of the Orthodox Church in Russia. You look very different. Your personalities will be different. Your spiritualities will be different. Your gifts will be different. And yet... We need each other. We help each other. And we're all on one path, which is the path of Jesus Christ. And we know that path because we're listening to the same voice. There is one Holy Spirit. Next week, I'm going to do my podcast on the Holy Spirit for Pentecost. But we see the Holy Spirit very present here because it's the Holy Spirit, that love that unites us, right? And saints need saints. We need, you know, I need the example of Damien of Malachi, even if I'm not called to go live on a leper colony. There are so many treasures I can learn from his life. There's not one life you encounter that you can say, I don't like that. I don't get anything from it. Maybe you can't follow every spirituality, right? You know, you can't do all the Dominican prayers and the Benedictine prayers and the Franciscan prayers every day and still fulfill your duty. I get it. But you can learn from every saint because what you're learning is, is, is virtue. There's, maybe you're not going to imitate and implement it in your own life that way. But there's no life that God brings to you that you shouldn't listen to. We need to listen to the voice of Christ. But that kind of brings me to the next thing. Why do saints need saints? Because sometimes the voice of Christ speaks to us through another person. You know, most of us are not going to hear voices the way that some saints did. 
We're not going to pray and hear God say, you know, go buy a lotto ticket. <laughs> I mean, he might, and it's happened, I'm sure, and people won. But normally, that's not the way he works. He usually speaks to us in a different way. How does he speak to us? Through each other. Saints need saints. You know, a lot of times those friendships that form between saints are between one soul who is um, sort of a, a, a blessed soul by God, like St. Faustina, and then somebody given to guide her, you know, Father Sapoko, I think it is, Sapotko or something. And a friendship is born. They have very different roles. You know, Faustina's wrapped up in Jesus. And she just kind of passes on to her father what he gives her. And then he has to go and kind of like figure out how to implement it in the church and like guide her soul and, you know, do all of this. Very different roles. And they're united in that love of Christ. That's kind of the gift of a spiritual director or a spiritual father, a spiritual mother. It's somebody, it's not somebody that tells you what to do. It's somebody who can listen to you. And say, I hear the voice of God, of our shepherd, here in what you're saying. You know, follow this way. It's not like a control thing. It's, it's kind of having a second set of ears. You know, maybe you have the gift to hear God and somebody else has the gift to tell you how to implement that in your own life even. We see that between married saints. There are several, you know, saints that were married couples. And I'm sure that the husband helped the wife and the wife helped the husband. But goodness, they weren't the same. They had different jobs in the family. They had different gifts, different spiritualities even sometimes. And yet they helped each other. You know, Benedict and Scholastica were a brother and sister. They helped each other to hear the voice of God. It says that last night before Scholastica, that last time Benedict visited her before she died, he wanted to leave and she said, we're having such an amazing conversation. Stay a little longer. And she prayed and a thunderstorm came to make him be able to stay. And two weeks later, I think, she died. But they were helping each other to listen. You know, sometimes I'm sure with sheep, if one of them hears the voice of the shepherd, he starts to go and the others follow, right? Because they have a herd mentality in a good way. You know, you can have a bad herd mentality when you're following the world like a false shepherd. Then it is bad to just kind of go along with the flow, right? To not think. God gave us a brain so that we can think. And Jesus said that to follow him is to follow the narrow road. So, you know, on the other hand, there might not always be a whole lot of people going the same way as you. But that's the difference between the sheep and the goats. The goats, you might be mixed in with a bunch of goats. Goats go their own way. But sheep, they stay together and they stay very, very bonded with their shepherd. You know, another characteristic of sheep that I see with the saints is that there's not ever in a saintly relationship jealousy, judgmentalness, competition, right? Truly saintly people build each other up. I remember reading a beautiful book once about Catherine Dougherty and Dorothy Day. They had very similar missions in the same time. You know, at one point they were both living with the poor in the slums and they weren't competitive. They built each other up. They helped each other. St. Dominic was around the time of St. Francis of Assisi. And some people said, why didn't they just come together? Because they had different gifts in the church. And they weren't competitive. Each did their job and they built each other up. We're not supposed to be, you know, jealous and see God really blessing somebody and be like, oh, they're not that good anyway. Or I, you know, <laughs> I don't, you know, I could do that better or something. No, we're supposed to always be life-giving and like the saints, build each other up. Teresa of Avila and John of the Cross. John really helped her soul for a period of time. But they had a friendship that was even deeper than that. And when he got out of prison, he went and stayed with her sisters. 
and she helped him reform the male Carmelites. But they, she didn't do it. She just kind of helped him to do it. She shared her vision and then he implemented it the way that the Lord was speaking through him. So it's really important that we remember in the spiritual life that we need each other, right? Saints need saints. And so one person's sanctity doesn't ever outshine another person. Like you see a saintly person walk in a room. Sometimes I've heard people say, I don't like her because she's too holy or I don't like so-and-so, right? You're not supposed to feel that way like, oh, or I don't need to go there because they're doing it all, right? It's not like there's only room for one saint in a parish or in a world, family or in a world. No, the more the merrier. And like imagine the synergy when you get two together. What if you had a family of saints? Look at that Oma family I talked about last week, right? That got martyred. The, the greater they shine, the greater brilliance is in the room, right? And so it's not a competition of light. A saint who's truly authentically a saint wants the other saints to be formed and to live their mission. They're happy to see it. Can you imagine if sheep were jealous, if they were competitive? They'd get killed by their predators right away. They have to have those close bonds together. I mean, they can't, they can't run super fast. They can run, but, you know, their, their greatest defense is being together and then the shepherd staying close to him. Well, think about how we need each other. You know, we are not dumb animals. Although sheep are smarter than people think. <laughs> but... You know, when I see my brother or my sister falling away from Christ, like I got to pull him back. I'm supposed to go out of my way and really reach that arm out to pull them back to him. Because we need each other to be holy. We, you know, we have a responsibility for each other. So often I think in today's world, because it's so competitive and people, you know, focus on dog eats dog and like stepping on each other to climb a ladder to be more successful and it bleeds into the spiritual life. You know, you have to be someone in order to be holy and important in the church, right? Mm -mm. And so we see that illness and yet God gives us the remedy in calling us as sheep. Because instead, we're supposed to build each other up, right? Can you imagine, um, you know, if, if everybody did that, a house that's divided among itself cannot stand, right? So Satan loves to divide people and, and do that. But the remedy we have is that single-heartedness of the shepherd that draws all the sheep into his fold that says you're all important, that gives everyone a special gift, that wants everyone to shine. You know, when you are um, in a family that has authentic love, you get as excited about a success of your sister or your brother as you would, as if it was your own, right? Like I remember, I could care less about sports and basketball. I could remember crying at night if my little brother BJ lost a basketball game. <laughs> Why? Because I loved him that much, right? That awful feeling. I even remember when my sisters, my little sister married a football coach. She was a religion teacher. It's kind of cute. And he sells RVs now just because you can't live off of that with a large family. They've got nine children. But um, I remember, you know, she loved him so much. She'd get like panicked over his games because he really wanted to win and she wanted what he wanted. And I loved my sister so much that I would get stressed out when I'd be watching her kids on a Friday night and like, I could care less about football. I don't even understand football. But I knew it was important to somebody who I loved, right? That's the kind of relationship we're supposed to have even within the church. We carry each other's burdens, right? We're like a Simon of Cyrene or a Veronica that see the voice and see the face of Christ in each other and pick up each other's cross. 
So not only do we, are we not bothered when other people succeed and shine, we want to sacrifice to make them shine, right? It's really beautiful. And, you know, sometimes um, it's just in normal friendships that we grow the most in the spiritual life. It's, you know, being able to pick, throw something off somebody's heart, really, you know. Here, here's my situation. Share your perspective back. In that, we're helping each other to hear the voice of the shepherd. And Jesus speaks, and he speaks to each one of us differently. So, you know, to my friend, when, I, when we were in Russia, you know, I would get strong impressions in my heart in prayer. And um, God guided me, oh, he guided me in like a jillion different ways, really, when I think about it. But the sister that I lived with, was very, um, very direct. God always spoke to her through scripture, period. And so like when we had something to discern, like I might say, you know, I was praying, I got this impression or this is what came to my mind or, you know, this is, you know, um, some words that I felt echoing within my heart. But she would say, scripture says this, Jesus spoke in this scripture. And it helped and confirmed it with each other. Right. When I used to work in the exorcism ministry and we would have like a group of people and the exorcist who was very capable and he could do the prayers, but he also had a deep knowledge of the interior life. He had very sensitive perceptions of things, but he always would ask the group of us there, those who brought the person or, you know, what are you thinking? What do you what do you feel about what was just shared or what just happened? Is the Lord speaking anything? And we'd all throw it on the table. And sometimes he'd accept it all. Sometimes there's something that might seem a little off that he'd kind of go by, you know. Why? Because we all have different gifts. You know, and the, the church is almost like a big herd of sheep. We're all going to look very, very differently from each other, right? And each one is going to have a different need. And you have to remember that if you're called to be a shepherd, <laughs> right? Or a shepherdess. Like, don't, you can't give the same thing to every person all the time. And yet, we're supposed to build each other up and help each other be, you know, a Shetland uh, sheep is not going to be, I don't know how, you know, a Portland sheep. But we have to help each other be the best kind that they can be. A black-faced sheep is not a Hampshire down. They look very different. They behave very differently. So we want to help each other be saints. But you also want to remember you're not an island. Saints need saints. You know, even if the path that the Lord has placed before me right now is, you know, to just spread my books in, in the Middle East and in Africa and different places, right? to share podcasts, to kind of teach a little more. I never thought I'd be this public. I love the hidden silent life. But even this work cannot be done alone. I have these gifts that the Lord has given, but I don't have the gift of finances to finance it. Somebody else does. I don't have the knowledge on the ground in these countries as to how to arrange printing or distribute, distributing it. You know, in, in Africa, they were explaining there's a system where you don't use the post office. You use like taxi drivers going to different cities and, you know, it's cheaper, but it's trustworthy. And I didn't get it. And I said, if that's the way you guys do it, do it. Like, you know, you know more about that. There's, you know, a different font that works better in this language than in ours. And so like in my Polish books, we had to find different fonts because not all of our fonts, when, when you print things, have the same um, letters as the Polish alphabet. So you, we all need each other. And what's the fruit of it? Souls receiving a message from God and bearing fruit. I send my books to Pakistan. My translator goes into churches and teaches it sets up little groups, forms people who then go out to other churches and give witnesses. They're the gardeners of, excuse me, my little seed. 
and they bear incredible fruit. But the fruit that I'm seeing right now is not Mary Klaska's fruit. I offered one little seed and prayer and suffering, right? But what they have done to cultivate it is so incredible. The spirituality of Therese of Lisieux goes way beyond Therese of Lisieux. She lived something, something brilliant, something beautiful. But God needed people to understand her and interpret her and present her to the world in a particular way for that gift of spiritual childhood to take root. The gift of spiritual childhood is God's gift, not Therese's. And he gave it to Therese and put it in her to show an example to the world. But then he really needed her sisters to command her to write it down and then to share it with people. And then, you know, even down to today, he needs somebody concretely inspired with a beautiful vision of a statue of her and then to make it and then to put it in a church where some little kid is going to see it and then understand spiritual childhood from that statue. And like all of that movement of divine grace really has very little to do with Therese and herself. It's God using her. And that's how he's going to work in our lives. He is going to help us to hear his voice through each other. And sometimes it's pointing out the voice of God. Sometimes it's just encouraging each other, right? When I listen to the teachings of the, of the saints, when I can have conversations that are living with people, I can't tell you how much that helps my spiritual life. So don't be afraid. Here, just at the end, we're going to keep this kind of on the shorter end. But don't be afraid of differences would be the number one, right? All the saints were different. All the saints were different. All of God's sheep are different. And yet he still calls them all his sheep, right? You're going to have different gifts and different spiritualities, different callings. But like, say you can't figure out God's will in your life. Go talk to someone who seems to be holy. Maybe not who talks about God a lot, but where you see virtue in their life, right? Ask them their opinion. You don't have to take it. They might give you a perspective to hear the voice of of your shepherd, of God, better. It's hard because in today's world, you've got all this loudness, right? TV and music and all this. And then you've got like these crazy media voices and like everybody's opinion on everything. And it's just overload. How do you hear that still small voice in your heart? The voice of the shepherd, kind of because we need each other, right? So here at the end, let's just say a prayer and ask the Lord to open our hearts to help us to recognize his voice, to recognize his presence and his voice in other people. We thank him for the gift of spiritual friendship and of, of the saints who have gone before us and have died, but also for those who are called to be living saints with us, who are we willing to reach out a hand, who to live virtue heroically in order to help us be the sheep that we're created to be, right? We ask the Lord to bless all those listening to this, to truly see the gifts that God has given them and their differences and to cultivate what God has asked of them, to let go of what God has not asked of them. And we ask the Lord to provide them with people to complement what they need so that we can be one, one fold, one sheep, one, um, one fold, one herd, right? with our one shepherd, Jesus Christ. We ask that our hearts be attuned to truly hearing him at all times, in all places, in all things. And that we be content with who we are in his arms, just like Our Lady needed him and he needed her. Our Lady needed Joseph. She even needed John. We ask to not be afraid of our needs, not be afraid to ask for help. And by leaning on each other and encouraging each other, that we can follow that narrow road after those voice and the, that voice and the footsteps of our shepherd into the heavenly kingdom. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit 
as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Thank you.